presser. Nothing personal word of the day is presser. That's lingo. I'm bringing you inside sports and business and public relations. A presser is when you schedule a press conference to make an announcement. You're supposed to make it a major announcement. And it used to be that you would tease. You'd call the media and say, please show up at 10 a.m. on a Tuesday for a press conference where the new owner of the Mets will be made available and the new president, Sandy Alderson, will be made available. And then everyone shows up. They set up cameras. You've got the PR people. They check their feeds. They get the microphones ready. They call up for 10. Steve Cohn is up with Sandy Alderson in the offices. You decide where you're going to have this presser because every presser needs a location. The location has significance sometimes. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it's in a studio. And you announce when it's happening. And then you wait a few minutes for the rest of the media to come. If it's going live, which some pressers do, big pressers, a presser announcing a new owner of a New York baseball franchise, that's going to be live. When the team is on a network that it used to own, that it no longer owns, but the owners, former owners who sold the team own the network and they're looking for content at all times, they're going to go live. That's SNY. When your league has a network that's looking for live content all the time, and that's called MLB Network, they're going to go live. So what you do is you coordinate with the networks. They say it's called for 10. We're going to be live at top of the hour at 10. And then we're going to show Steve and Sandy walking in at 10.03 and started at 10.05. There'll be an introduction by the head of PR, head of communications, who will welcome everybody and say, I'd like to introduce the new owner and CEO of your New York Mets, Steve Cohn. And there he is. Tylus, of course, a man of the people, a 15 billionaire times over. Of course, that's 15 times over billionaire, 14.8. Although when the market goes down, maybe it's 14.7, 14.6, 14.9. Pick a day, pick a number. Steve Cohn. I'm a man of the people. I'm a fan. So Steve Cohn prepares for his press conference, and he does it the following way. He calls in his business PR people. Then he calls in some baseball PR people, and they try to do a Q&A list for him. That is part two of the preparation. Part one of the preparation is a statement that gets read first. Some owners want to do it off the top of their head. Some owners want to read a prepared statement. Some owners have a teleprompter. Some owners look down when they're talking. Some owners look at the camera. Some owners try to wear ties. Some owners try not to wear ties. Ties used to be a big thing. They're not a big thing anymore. People think it's too stuffy. Do you know why I don't wear a tie? If you're watching this on Nothing Personal with David Sampson YouTube channel, part of my deal with CBS, I don't wear ties. I just don't. When I came to Florida in 2002, I wanted to bring Wall Street business attire to the Marlins. So I demanded everyone wear ties and suits and business clothes. I went to a meeting day two with a local lawyer who said to me, you know, why are you wearing a tie? This is Florida. And this was in February. He said, come summer, you're going to change your policy. And I said, there's no way. I want people to look professional. Come July, that was completely changed. It's a thousand degrees. That's why I don't wear ties. Then as the years passed, ties became less in vogue because it looks stuffy. And if you want to look like you're relaxed, like you're normal, like you're chill and cool, you don't wear a tie. Steve Cohn wears a quarter zip over a button down shirt. I am you. You are me. He knows he's got to hit four points when you buy the Mets from the Wilpons. What's the number one issue that Mets fans have had? Number one, we haven't won, which I think is a horrible narrative. The Mets won a World Series in 86. The Mets went to the World Series in 2015. But that's the number one thing you address. We haven't won. I want to win. Page one, answer one. Point one of every press conference of every new owner. I want to win. Cover that, Steve. All right, I'll cover that. Two, pretend you're Richard Attenborough in Jurassic Park. 
Do you got that, Coca? Do you have any idea what that reference is? Richard Attenborough, a very famous director who directed Gandhi, actually. He was the founder of Jurassic Park. He played the man who invented and started Jurassic Park. And when Jeff Goldblum and Sam O'Neill and Laura Dern came to visit the park, he would point things out and say, we spared no expense. That was his famous line, except he said it in an amazing Australian accent. We spared no expense. <laughs> that was so not Australian. That's the second thing you have to say. He said it. Next, tell me, are you prepared to lose money? Hmm, it's another thing that's gonna be covered. Is that really your business? Yeah, I guess it is the business of fans of baseball teams. They wanna know not that you're rich. They wanna know not that you're a fan. They wanna know not that you're gonna win. They wanna know not that you're excited. They wanna know not that you're gonna have celebrities and they don't care. Are you gonna lose money? More important than even spending money. Riddle me that. Riddle me the fact that fans would prefer owners to lose money and be bad. Look no further than the Miami Dolphins. Having a good year this year with Tank Fortua. They just were all loving Steve Ross, even though he's one of the most unsuccessful NFL owners out there. They love him because he spends money and loses money. Okay, fair enough. If you're Steve Cohn, you got to make sure you say, I'm here because of you. I'm doing this for the fans. I'm not trying to make money. That's a direct quote. I'm doing it for the fans. I'm not trying to make money. I'm not in this to be mediocre. I want something great. Sounds normal. I'm trying to build a sustainable franchise. That's another fancy group of words that every PR firm tells an owner to say. It was Jeter's first words. I'm trying to build a sustainable franchise. I don't want to be good one year and bad three years. I want to be good every year. Steve, find me one owner and one team president who wants to be bad every year and good once in a while. Doesn't need to be said. What's your payroll going to be? That's a question that's going to be asked. There's a special rule in baseball when you're an executive, you do not give payroll numbers. And let me tell you why, because people are mistaken. <clears throat> there are fans and media who believe that the reason why executives don't give payroll numbers is that they don't want the fans to have an unrealistic expectation about what the payroll should be. And then if the payroll is below that, they're upset. The reason why we don't give payroll numbers as executives is we don't want agents to know how much we have to spend. We want to be able to say to an agent in a negotiation, listen, I'm at my limit. The agents know every team's payroll. They keep track of every team's payroll. When you meet an agent, they actually have your roster in front of them. They know exactly what every player is getting paid. You've got your roster in front of you. You know what every player is getting paid. When you say to the agent, hey, I'm all out of money. That's a song, except it's I'm all out of love. I'm all out of love. I can't live without you. That's what players want to hear. But if the agent knows what the plug-in payroll is, say you're Scott Boris, you say, listen, you got another 3 million a year. <coughs> Guaranteed. Why aren't you giving that up? So Steve Cohn got that right. He didn't specify what payroll would be. He merely said, we're a big market. We're going to have a payroll that is commensurate with the big market. People are saying he's going to be like the Dodgers. So everything's going well in the press conference. Everyone's excited. And then it went off the rails. And the reason it went off the rails is that two things were said that are going to come back to haunt the Mets. The first thing that was said is that Steve Cohn said that it will be a major disappointment and he will be majorly disappointed if they don't win the World Series in the next three to five years. The fans go crazy. The producers at CBS, Scott, Jack, fans everywhere, Coca's friends, they're losing their minds. Hold on, I'm gonna drink some Kool-Aid. I'm very thirsty right now. Hold on, I'm drinking it. Mm. That sugary water is so good. And do you know what the best part about Kool-Aid is? That it makes you even thirstier. 
it doesn't quench your thirst. That's the joke of Kool-Aid. It's never enough. It's a sugary mix that says more. Become addicted to my sugar and keep buying it. Hold on, I'm still thirsty. Drinking. Mm. God, that red flavored Kool-Aid. Steve, here's the line. We want to compete for the World Series every year. We want to be in the playoffs every year. That's what you say. You don't say we're going to win it in three to five years. There is no way to say that. And then tell your fans, we're ready to win now. We're going after net free agents right now. We're making a splash in free agency. We've got a Cy Young Award winner named Jacob DeGrom. We have a Rookie of the Year named Pete Alonzo. We've got a Marcus Stroman who's likely going to accept a qualifying offer by the time you hear this. Wait to see. And you want to win it in three to five years? Come on, man. Say I want to win it right now. 2021 seems like a perfect year to help everyone rebound from the pandemic. We're going to play for the World Series in 2021. He's given himself a three to five year cushion. I hope he wins it in three to five years. He knows better. Next. Sandy Alderson takes the uh, stand. He's the president. We're going to go back to a little bit about Steve Cohen, but I got to talk about Sandy Alderson first. Sandy Alderson is the former GM of the Mets under the Wilpons. Seven and a half years, he was the GM, complaining every step of the way that the Wilpons didn't give him the resources. Wah, wah. Give me a break. When you're a good GM, you don't need the resources. How about going to Oakland? You were there. Did you complain that the A's didn't give you enough money in payroll? No. You took that team and you won with that team. Now, all of a sudden, you're the president of a big market team with a 15 billionaire owner. And now you're throwing shade at your former owners. You know better than that, Sandy. You're better than that. Be better than that. He was asked about Brad Hand. Brad Hand is a $10 million player who got waived by the Cleveland Indians, one of the best closers in the game, and I would know because we released him because he was a failed starter for us, a failed bullpen guy for us, and we said, we've ruined him. He stinks. What do we know? Brad Hand crushed it for the Indians. The Indians, because of money, let him go. Sandy Alderson was asked about Brad Hand and why, if the Mets would claim, would have claimed Brad Hand. He went through waivers. Any team could have had him. All you had to do was claim him, pay him the $10 million, and you've got a back end of the bullpen guy. And the Mets bullpen, they signed Familia. They signed Batances. They have a closer named Edwin Diaz, a disastrous trade by the now fired back to being an agent, BV Wagonen. He said, if the timing would have been a little different, we might have jumped on that, Alderson said. Good. Stop there. When you're doing a press conference, it's better to say less. Go full Hamilton. Talk less. Smile more. Never let them know what you are in favor of for. Those aren't the words. It's damn close, though. But then Sandy kept going. He said, now, was that a good deal? I don't know. It's probably overpaying a little bit, but who knows? All right, lesson number two in the president's handbook when you're in front of the media, you act like you always know. Because if you don't know, who the hell does know? Your job is to know. You just said in front of your brand new boss, it may be overpaying, what do we know? What do I know? Do you know? I don't know. He may know. We got to hire a bunch of people who may know better than I know. Steve Cohn, you're not going to know. Just give us the money. Keep giving us money. And then we'll tell you what you know. You may think you know something, but I'm going to tell you you're a new owner. You don't know. I've been in the game forever. I'm 73 years old. I don't even know. Are you kidding me? It's probably overpaying a little bit. What music to agents ears? I always said the opposite. Players were overpaid. Now, we ended up overpaying a lot of players just because I didn't know. And we had other people who didn't know. It was a whole lot of not knowing. But we never admit that. You think we're going to admit that we overpaid Jared Salta-Lamakia or John Buck? 
or Al Leiter. Forget it. Never. Come on, Sandy. But then he didn't stop at that either. And this just blew my mind, Coca. It almost can't be real. He said, as Steve Cohn said, he's got a day job and he probably needs that day job to pay for some of the potential losses we have with the Mets. So from my standpoint, that's a good thing. Let's pretend that's a dangling qualifier, dangling modifier. And what he means is the good thing is that Steve has a day job. I'm the new owner of a team. I'm rich as hell. I want to hire someone who's going to treat my money the way I treat my money. I don't just throw money away. Rich people stay rich by being smart with their money. He brings in a team president, and I'm not politicking for the job, Steve. I've got a job with all of these listeners, and maybe even with CBS. You're saying to your owner as an operator of a team, thank God you have a day job so you can pay for the losses? My job is running the business is to increase revenue. It's to make sure that revenue covers expenses. It's to go to the owner and say, I have failed this year. If you want a payroll higher than 150, you're going to have to write a check because I can only give you enough revenue for a payroll of 150. Best case, 170. Worst case, 130. That's the range. Steve Cohn, owner, you tell me how much is our payroll going to be? And then I'm going to be embarrassed by the fact that I'm forcing you to write a check at the end of every year. Instead, Sandy goes ahead and says, that's a good thing. Steve Cohn says, ready to lose money. How are Mets fans not going to be disappointed? When you're an owner, John Henry bought the Marlins in 2000 and 1999, 2000 minus a year. Took the microphone when he bought the team and said, we need a new ballpark in Florida. And if we can't get public money, I'm going to pay for it myself. Well, everybody was listening. And when they asked him to pay for it himself, he said, you know what? JK, I'm moving to Boston where I can park my bus if I could keep it. You never say that you're going to lose money or spend your own money or say, I don't view this as a money-making opportunity. Why just be honest and say, listen, my dream, here's how I would have done Steve Cohn's opening if I'm Steve Cohn. Hi, my name's Steve. The reason I'm on Twitter is I do like hearing from fans. I'm going to try to answer as many as I can, but once I get too popular, I won't be able to get to all of it, but I'll assign a few people to monitor the account. I've been trying to buy the team forever. I had some issues with my business. It was a bit of a rocky road, but I am here today because I was lucky enough and fortunate enough in my job to make enough money where I could give the Wilpons what they wanted and I could have some money left over because I understand that there is work to be done. I understand that as part of this acquisition that there will be losses in the first year or two. After that, I expect that I will have proven to you, the fans of New York, the stakeholders, the season ticket holders, the corporate sponsors, our broadcast partners. I expect that after one to two years, I will have proven to you that we know how to run a sound organization that will be built from the bottom up. Our model is the Los Angeles Dodgers. We're going to make our farm system thick, not thin. We're not going to spend money on free agents until we are ready to win. And when we're ready, we're going to pounce the way the Dodgers did with Mookie Betts. And before that, I'm going to make sure that we give the necessary resources to our baseball people to make trades that will put us in a position to build our farm system just like the Dodgers did. We're going to take advantage of teams with smaller payrolls, less revenue. We're going to buy international slot money. We're going to take bad contracts in order to get good prospects. We are going to do all the things that only large revenue teams can do. And I'm going to augment that for the first year or two. You are going to see that I'm a man of my word. But I assure you, I want to win as badly as you do. I want a sustained winner as badly as you do. I am willing to invest in that winner. But I want you as my partner. 
I want to show people around this league that City Field can be sold out like Dodger Stadium. I want gate revenue to be bigger than Yankee Stadium. Let's show the Yankees that we are bigger and better than the Yankees. When the Yankees can charge their partners an amount of money that I used to consider exorbitant, we're going to charge you the same thing and you're going to love it because you're going to think you're getting a bargain. That's how to run a successful franchise. That's what I'm going to do. You want to judge me? Judge me in a decade. Don't judge me after 2020. Don't judge me after this set of free agents. Don't make me overpay for George Springer or JT Realmuto because I know we need catching and could use a left fielder. Judge me after I've been here and you've seen what we've done for this franchise. You don't have patience? I don't have patience either. We may win somewhere along the way, can't guarantee it, but what I guarantee is today is a new day. It is the first day of this ownership. My dream has come true, and my second dream is to make your dream come true as often as possible. Say that, because if you do that, then you can't be setting yourself up for failure. And the problem is, what he did totally set him up for failure. Wait to see. Well, you know who set up for failure, Coca? Tony La Russa. Yesterday's show on Nothing Personal on November 10th was yesterday's show. Today's 11-11. By the way, today's the anniversary. Nine years ago, the Florida Marlins became the Miami Marlins. 11-11-11 is when the Florida Marlins became the Miami Marlins. We had Pitbull. Mark Anthony got a tattoo, 11-11-11, having nothing to do with the Marlins. It may even be covered up right now because I don't think he's with that person anymore. But anyway, I digress. Today is 11-11, and the person who's having a bad day and the owner, who I don't know how he recovers from this, is Jerry Reinsdorf and Tony Lewis. So we covered it yesterday. DUI. The White Sox knew about it. He was charged the day before he got hired. You heard the segment, listened to it. It was the top of the show yesterday. You can download, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. If you're listening to this, then you know where and just hit subscribe and tell your friend to listen to it too, would you? Thank you. Well, news came out today on Tony La Russa and it was something else. All right, here's the rule. When you get pulled over by the police, whether you're white or you're black or whatever color you are, you put your hand on the wheel to show the cops your hands. The officer comes over, you tell the officer everything you're going to do before you do it. You listen to any instructions. You only answer the questions that are asked of you. That's it. If I'm the lawyer for anybody who gets pulled over, you don't talk other than the questions that are asked. Tony La Russa was standing next to his car. Word came out. It went up on a curb and was smoking. I don't know whether he was smoking. I know the car was. Cops came, thought he was drunk, started asking him questions. And wouldn't you know it, Tony La Russa could not keep quiet. And so he said, when we are talking to our players and our staff, there is one rule that trumps the other rules. If you can't keep your mouth closed, which you should, don't tell them who you are because they're taping you and you're going to look like a jackass and it's not going to matter. Tony La Russa said, do you see my ring? The officer asked, what, what do you mean? Tony La Russa said, I'm a Hall of Famer baseball person. I'm legit. I'm a Hall of Famer, brother. You're trying to embarrass me. I don't even know what to say. Vince Namoli was the owner of the Tampa Bay Devil Rays way back when. He was pulled over for speeding. Maybe it was drunk driving. I don't want to sully him. May he rest in peace. It was pulled over for something. May have just been speeding. And he said, do you know who I am? 
I am the owner of the Tampa Bay Devil Rays. I am Vince Namoli. I am Tony La Russa. Don't screw with me, man. I'm a Hall of Famer. Do you know how much cops care? They don't. Remember I told you cops in Jupiter were actually more excited by that than less excited. And they're taping you and they're going to release it. Tony La Russa's got a problem and so does Jerry Reinsdorf. Because Jerry Reinsdorf is not going to fire Tony La Russa. Jerry Reinsdorf is not going to admit he made a mistake in hiring him. Jerry Reinsdorf is going to keep going. And Tony La Russa is going to be answering these questions every Munton Gdunashtik. Every Monday and Wednesday. Every day. That's an expression. Please, if you learn one thing from less, nothing personal, we talk a lot of PR. We teach a lot of PR. That's sort of cool, right? Please learn. Speak less. Don't flex. Follow directions. And finally, keep calm and carry on. Okay. Why does Marcus Stroman keep talking? Um, Marcus Stroman is a pitcher who's been hurt. Good guy, by the way. Very good guy. So I want to make sure that I'm clear. I'm not selling Marcus Stroman. Marcus Stroman said uh, when asked about the Larusa situation, because Larusa is, uh, you know, he's a 76 year old white guy. There is some talk that he's had some not nice things to say about um, people of color. I've never, I've been around Tony a lot. He's never exhibited any sign of racism, any sign of of anything other than ego and uh, intelligence. But apparently uh, he has, and Marcus Stroman has had enough of Tony La Russa. But then Marcus Stroman reacted to the Tony La Russa DUI and to the hiring of La Russa by basically saying the one thing that players should never say because it's disingenuous. There's no amount of money that would make me accept a contract with the White Sox. It's a lie. Why would you say that? When you know you have a qualifying offer that you're likely to take with the Mets, when you know that the White Sox are not offering you a contract because your agent has already spoken to every single team because the only reason you're accepting a qualifying offer is when you don't have a contract with somebody else. Why would you take one of the possible 29 other teams out of it by publicly announcing you have no interest in playing for Tony La Russa? It's not as though there's so many different options. It's not like buying soap. I refuse to use Dove. Not going to be dirty. There's plenty of soaps out there. Not plenty of teams. I think Stroman would have been better if he made the point that I want to be signed with the White Sox. I want to play because I want to help Tony La Russa. And I want to help Jerry Reinsdorf. I want to teach them how to be racially tolerant. I want to educate them on what it is to be inclusive. I want to educate the White Sox on the concept of belonging. I want to play for the only black president of baseball operations, Kenny Williams. I want to make a difference in this world, not just with my arm, but with my brain and my mouth. And the best way to do it is not to preach to the choir. The best way to do it is to try to help people change. So if you're out there, Chicago, I'm asking you to give me $1 more than $18.9 million. Just a dollar more. 18900001 dollars $18,900,001. Then I will be a White Sox. And together, we will win on the field and we will win off the field. How great would that have been for Marcus Stroman to say? Seriously. One time. Eh, we'll keep waiting. All right, after the break, we're going to get to some wait to sees. I'm going to review a movie that has a swear word in it. Remember in the Emmys, every time they said Shit's Creek, they had to put on the screen that it's a TV, an Emmy-nominated TV series called Shit's Creek. Otherwise, it would be saying shit. Well, I watched a movie called Shit House. That's the name of the movie, okay? After the break. Welcome back to Nothing Personal. Today is 11-11-20. Today is Veterans Day. I would like to give a shout out Veterans Day. It's a uh, 
every day should be Veterans Day. If you have served our country, I want to thank you because you've done more for me than anyone in the world. You have made it so I am safe. You've made it so I can do a show, so I was able to run a baseball team. You've made it so I can vote. You've made it so I'm free. You, you did something that I never had the guts to do. I never had the courage to do. I never had the bravery to do. There's gonna be at the end of this week, maybe even tomorrow, Coca, a sit down with Logan Morrison. Logan Morrison and I went to visit troops with a bunch of other guys, including Jeff Conan and Andre Dawson. We visited troops in Bahrain and Qatar. We visited wounded troops in Frankfurt at Landstuhl Air Base at the hospital, Landstuhl Hospital. It's the most humbling experience in the world. When you see veterans, don't just be upset because they get to board first. It's such a terrible thing what's happened with veterans over the years. Show them respect because they're doing something that you don't want to do, but you demand be done. Thank you to everyone out there who has served. I don't think the word is happy Veterans Day. It is respectful Veterans Day. I wish that I could salute you in a way that would not, I don't think a civilian's allowed to salute. I don't know that, Coca. Is that a rule? I don't want to salute and be disrespectful, but if I could salute, because I'm allowed, I would be saluting. Let's just say that whatever I can do to show you respect, the least of which is pointing out that today is a day that everyone should thank a veteran, except let's make every day Veterans Day. So I watch a movie every day and uh, I review one. I'm watching a TV series now too, by the way, because I watch TV series too. But I'm watch, I watched a movie, it's on Amazon. It's called Shit House. I, I couldn't believe it when I saw that it was produced, written, and directed, and starring a 20-year-old named Connor Rafe. I never heard of the guy. He's not exactly, he doesn't look like a above the title star. He's a fine looking college kid. I wasn't aware till after the movie what his role was. It's Cooper, not Connor. Thank you, Coca. I don't know why I said Connor. So this is a movie about a boy who goes to college. He's leaving home for the first time. He's homesick. He's got a roommate who he's not friends with. He's got, which people can, asso can definitely not associate with. What's the word, Coca? I'm having a brain moment. When you, when you can appreciate something that someone else is saying. It's not associate with, oh my God. God darn it, dang it, dog it. In any case, Coca, doesn't matter. When Coca doesn't give me the word, it means he doesn't have it either. And it means he's furiously looking for it. So we can all appreciate freshman roommates who we don't like in school. We can appreciate what it's like to feel lonely and isolated and not have friends, to miss home. This is a movie about this young man who doesn't go home. He tries to get involved with groups of people. He tries to meet people, tries to go to college parties, ends up meeting his resident advisor, which is a person who lives in the dorm and is supposed to be in charge. My resident advisor was a guy named Steve at Tufts freshman year on the third floor of Bush Hall. I'll never forget you, Steve. I cannot think for the life of me what you did to be additive, but we did party together and that was fun. So he goes on a date with his RA and they end up having sex and he falls in love. And to her, he was just a one night stand. And he was blown away by that fact. He thought that his cure to loneliness had happened. His roommate, <clears throat> who is a party animal alcoholic, pot smoking, vomiter tells him to forget about her and come to a party at a place called the shit house. So they go to a party <clears throat> and he meets a bunch of people. The move, the movie goes on. <clears throat> By the way, I just hit mute on a microphone that I'm not using. Did that work Coca? I don't think that really worked. In any case, I wouldn't think this is plugged in. This is what's not plugged in. Can you see this on the air? 
this whole thing, I pressed the mute button. I wonder why that didn't work. Interesting. Okay. So this movie written by this young kid, here's how it happened. <clears throat> In the credits, there was a name that I noticed that struck me, and the name was Jay Duplass. Jay Duplass, I believe his brothers of Mark Duplass. They are incredibly talented filmmakers, writers, actors, producers. And I wondered why there was a thank you. So then I started reading up about the movie and here's what happened. To all of you who think your dreams can't come true, be Cooper Rafe. He wrote a screenplay, who doesn't? He wrote a two page treatment, who doesn't? Nobody bought it, nobody liked it. It got ignored left, right, and center. Cooper goes on Twitter and DMs Jay Duplass. By the way, he obviously DM'd a gazillion other people. Jay Duplass reads the script, the two pages, contacts him on Twitter and says, hey, I think you got something here. The next thing you know, they give money to Cooper Rafe, not a big budget. There's no special effects. There's no green screens. There's no re releases of uh, like in Mission Impossible when you pull off the face. Nothing like that. It's perfect dialogue. It's like Before Sunset. Did you ever, Before Sunrise, the movie with uh, Ethan Hawke and Julie Delpy? That's a trilogy, one of the great written movies of all time about people who stay up all night getting to know each other. There's a scene in Shithouse where he is dating his RA for that one night and they're together all night and it's sort of like, it reminded me of Before Sunrise. So Cooper Rafe makes the movie and then he thanks Jade Duplass at the end. Let's help Cooper Rafe get money to make another movie because he somehow has it. Okay, I wanna go to, uh, quickly, I wanna say before this ends, this show, I wanna talk for one quick minute about Tommy Heinsohn. I just wanna say that Tommy Heinsohn passed away and you may not know who Tommy Heinsohn is. Tommy Heinsohn played for the Celtics. He won 10 NBA championships in 20 seasons. He won two more as coach. One of the most successful players, he's in the Hall of Fame as a player, he's in the Hall of Fame as a coach. When you think Celtics, you may think Bill Russell. Tommy Heinsohn deserves to be thought of in that vein. He led the team in scoring for four of those championships, by the way, no slouch. Rest in peace, Tommy. Okay, I wanna talk now, if, if you don't mind, a little bit about a, uh, um, the, the San Francisco Giants, Coca. Can we do that? Do we have time? We don't? Okay, I guess we're gonna do that tomorrow. Uh, we, we did this so you wanna talk to Samson that was supposed to be in the show and we didn't get to it, but I wanna tease it. I don't know if it'll be tomorrow, but it'll be, we will get to this. And the reason why I wanna uh, get to it is it's a great question. And I love when you ask questions. So, so you wanna to talk to Samson is a segment where you go into uh, my Twitter, David P. Samson, ask a question. And someone asked a question about the San Francisco Giants and a lawsuit that's going on. And I am gonna to get to it, I promise you, because it's that good a question. Uh, it interested me greatly, <clears throat> but time is time. Okay, last night, did you see the news about Don Mattingly? Don Mattingly won manager of the year. We got that, wait to see. We said he would. Kevin Cash won manager of the year. We got that, wait to see. Wait to see is when he tell you what's gonna happen and then it does, or it doesn't, but we're gonna revisit it. What interests me about these two things, I wanna clarify the votes for the awards that MLB is doing. They've already announced rookies of the year. They did managers of the year. Tonight, I believe we're getting Cy Young and MVPs. These are voted on prior to the postseason, which is why Randy Rosarena, as an example, didn't get votes for Rookie of the Year because he wouldn't have gotten votes. If you did Rookie of the Year after the postseason, there wouldn't have been a race. He's Rookie of the Year with what he did with the Rays in the postseason. Kyle Lewis is super happy that they don't do it that way. Don Mattingly and Kevin Cash are the same thing. Kevin Cash does not get manager of the year because of what happened in the postseason. He gets manager of the year because the Tampa Bay Rays were the number one seed in the American League. That is manager of the year worthy. Now, query, can you be manager of the year without having the front office of the year? How can 
Kevin Cash, win manager of the year, and not credit Matt Silverman, the president, Stu Sternberg, the owner, and the GM, whose name I get wrong every time, Coca. I want to say it's Eric Nylander, but I think I'm going to be wrong on almost all counts. So forgive me. But if he doesn't win executive of the year, then it can't be real. Because the only reason that the team is successful, they've got a good guy in the clubhouse who can keep the peace, who can keep the clubhouse loose, but it's the front office. Don Mattingly. We didn't run a team with Don Mattingly the way teams are run now. We didn't give Mattingly the lineup. Mattingly had to go through his lineup. It's Eric Neander. I was close. I had an extra L. Thank you, Coca. We didn't tell Mattingly who to play, what batting order, but Mattingly had to run it by us, so we knew. We never wanted to be surprised by the lineup, so he would tell us who's in, who's out, what he's thinking about. We would go to him with some analysis or some thoughts on putting Stanton in the two-hole, for example, or putting Stanton in the four-hole, or giving Stanton a rest, or what to do with Yelich. But at the end of the day, we were one of the rare teams, shockingly, as meddling as I was, one of the rare teams who did not make the manager do everything we wanted him to do. We wanted him to manage the game because we trusted his eyes, we trusted his heart, and we trusted his gut. Those days are over in Major League Baseball. Does Don Mattingly still have that power? Well, this past year, he did. Mike Hill was his president of baseball operations since let go, not renewed. Mike Hill deserves to win executive of the year for a different reason than Eric Neander deserves to win executive of the year. Eric Neander deserves it because he de facto is running that team in that clubhouse. Mike Hill deserves it because he let Don Mattingly do his job and Don Mattingly was damn good at it. And Mike Hill did those 150 plus transactions, made it so the Marlins could be competitive, could continue playing, found players that Jeter and other people had never heard of. And Mattingly took those players. He found a way to use them to put them in a position to succeed, took in Starling Marte at the deadline, made him the leader. Miguel Rojas allowed Marte to come in and be a co-leader. Mattingly made that happen. Don Mattingly is an extremely deserving manager of the year. What I like about that pick is that it's two sort of opposite guys, right? Cash and Mattingly. I tweeted this and I mean it. I hope Mattingly ends up in the Hall of Fame. He deserves it. I hope being manager of the year helps his case with the Veterans Committee. Wait to see. Cooperstown, you need Don Mattingly there. So tonight's wait to see is Cy Young an MVP. So here they are. I think the Cy Youngs are going to be easy. I think you may have a unanimous American League Cy Young. Wait to see. It's going to be Shane Bieber. I think the National League will be a little bit tighter. I think it'll be Trevor Bauer. I think the MVP races are going to be tight but I'm going Jose Abreu with the White Sox and Freddie Freeman of the Braves. Wait to see Cy Young Bieber, Cy Young Bauer. Wait to see MVP Abreu, MVP Freeman. Who benefits the most from winning the Cy Young? Trevor Bauer. Trevor Bauer is trying to become a Met. He took a picture of himself holding a Mets hat among other caps. That made me laugh. Trevor Bauer makes me laugh. Coca, can you imagine how funny Trevor Bauer is? Trevor Bauer had his agent come out and say yesterday, he's a big fan of big markets in terms of building his brand. I think he's made it very clear and he's good at it. He's good at finding creative ways to build a brand. He built a pretty incredible brand, especially over, I think, the last year after being in an entirely Ohio market because he was on the Reds and the Indians. So if you can build the brand that he has in Ohio, imagine what he can do in a bigger market. Red alert, red alert. If I'm running the Mets, I'm staying so far away from Trevor Bauer, your head will spin. I'm going to tell my fan base, we're going to get pitching, but it's not going to be Trevor Bauer. Has there ever been a quote from an agent that is more selfish than that quote? He's a fan of big markets in terms of building his brand? Horse hockey. He's a fan of big markets because they'll give him the most money. Some players can be incredibly selfish. We had a whole segment on selfish players, didn't we, Coca? Selfishness, 
how hard it is to win with too many selfish players. Trevor Bauer is more trouble than he's worth, and his agent is not doing him any favors. But let there be no misunderstanding about tonight's Cy Young Award winner. To Trevor Bauer, it's all business. Sorry, Ohio. It's nothing personal.